Okay, we continue our slow um, upward march from sense uh, on our way to human political organization with Hobbes. So just to remind you, we started by dividing human faculties into bodily and mental ones, and then we started talking about mental ones beginning with sense and imagination and memory, and then all kinds of mental discourse, names, reasoning, knowledge, opinion, belief, and then last time we started talking about pleasure and pain and good and evil, and we saw this really radical thesis, pleasures and pains are just continuations of the conceptions formed in our minds on the basis of sense, and these give rise to appetites and aversions, or pursuit and avoidance, and we call good and evil those things which we pursue, and thus are pleasant, and thus are those conceptions which enhance our vitality, and we call evil or bad those um, conceptions which we have an aversion to or an avoidance of because they're painful, because they uh, are things we sense that inhibit our vital uh, motions. Okay? And um, there are, uh, you know, other theories of good and evil. This is a fairly reductive one to tie it to something so immediately evident as pleasure and pain, which are themselves reducible to sensations which are themselves reducible to the effects of some kinds of motions occurring outside of us. Um, we ended rather hastily talking about whether, because it's, there's a long philosophical tradition that says that good and bad can somehow ultimately be related in our life, and we can sum these or uh, connect them together into an overall concept of a final end or final condition that we want to be in. And this is sometimes called happiness or prosperity or eudaimonia or living well and so forth. And here again, Hobbes has a very reductive account of this. It's no more, he says, than continual enjoyment of pleasures. Um, so he, he actually objects to the traditional way of talking about this as being an end. It's not an end. People are, who are happy aren't at the end of living. They're in the middle of their lives. And they still necessarily have desires all the time. And desires are, can be painful. So um, so-called happy people can still be thirsty. They can still be hungry. They can still want to have sex. They can still want to warm up or cool down. And so there is no end to this. And there, if, if there's any point in um, coming up with a general term for the end, it can only mean enjoying more or a more continual succession of pleasures or less pains, in his view. Okay, so I'm going to go on to go into a little more detail of what he says about passions of the body and then passions of the mind, but are there any questions or discussion or comments on what we've covered so far since, since we had to so rapidly go through it last time? Yeah. Is this like a form of hedonism? Yes. So this is, I mean, this is a classic form of hedonism. So hedonism is the thesis that um, the purpose of life, the end of human life, the aim that we have in life is pleasure. Okay, and that comes from a Greek term, hedone, which means pleasure. So um, hedonism is pleasurism. 
as an ethical thesis. And Hobbes is definitely a hedonist because that's our only end. It's our only aim. Everything we pursue is on the basis of it causing us pleasure or pains. Will you have anything to say about theories that say virtue is our final end? Yeah, so he has an entire theory of virtue that is based on this, okay? And they are, um, we'll, we'll see a little bit of this in what we're talking about today, but to make a long story short, the things we cause, we call virtues, are powers that we have to produce or enjoy pleasures. And what we call vices are weaknesses that expose us to, that, 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 that indicate lack of power and weakness because of which we experience pain. So again, a reductive account. Virtue and vice, these high-minded terms, like justice and temperance and courage and so forth, wisdom, um, are all going to be reduced to powers or abilities to experience pleasure. And again, pleasure we can reduce to an effect of conceptions and conceptions to sense. So it is an empiricist, materialist, and hedonist theory. All there are material objects and a nominalist theory. All there are particular material objects out there, all we can know about them is what enters through our senses, and all we can say about what we should do, or how we should be, is um, having those sensations that we enjoy, and avoiding those that we don't. Okay, so, a little bit more on passions of the body, because he distinguishes these from passions of the soul. And this gets treated in Human Nature 8. He says, motion and agitation of the brain, which is called conception. Again, it continues to the heart. When it gets to the heart, then we start calling it passion. And he here distinguishes three kinds of conceptions we can have. The first one's very familiar to us, sense. That's a... Um, conception we have of things that are present to us. Remembrance, that's conceptions we have of things that are past, or rather of sensations that we had in the past. And expectation is um, of what's in the future. Now, obviously, we can't sense what's in the future, and we can't remember what's in the future, so there must be some tie between expectation and the present. So he says that all conceptions of future are based on remembrance of the past. Okay, so the reason why I think that um, I'll have ice with my drink is because I think that getting ice with my drink will mean that my drink is cold. Why do I think that? Because I've had ice in my drinks before, and I thought it was cold, or somebody who did have ice in their drinks and said it was cold, that I trust, reported that much to me. So all of our conceptions about the future are based on conceptions that have been formed in the present and that are remembered having occurred in the past. Okay, and they relate to powers that we have. Whosoever, he says, uh, expects pleasure to come, Okay, hope you all are expecting pleasures to come, like even the, the small pleasure of getting out of this class and or going on to have lunch later today or going on to drink at a party uh, later tonight. All of that must relate to some power you have within yourself thinking that you'll be able to attain a pleasure by analogy to something you have experienced in the past, like you've experienced having the enjoyment of eating lunch or the enjoyment of listening to music or the enjoyment of hanging out with friends or the enjoyment of having sex or whatever it is, um, is, again, cannot be based on anything but relating it to what happened already in sense. Did I see a hand? Okay, good. 
Now, the most basic... Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. But, like, what about when you're... This doesn't seem to make sense, because, like, babies intrinsically know that... Like, if everything we're doing is pursuing pleasure, like, a baby's gonna eat. It, it would probably, like, a baby would do that for the same reason, if that's the way... If that's kind of, like, the normal... Yes, the so he, he has to, to bite the bullet on that and say that, um, you know, babies experience pain... Um, they're fed, the, the feeding gives this, them a sensation of pleasure, so then they expect that pleasure in the future by feeding again. But until the baby's fed, there is no way that it has an appetite for feeding again, or an or, or, or can have an aversion to the pain. There's, there's, there's no reason... Um, so, babies are taught to eat, and they're taught to drink, in his view. They, they, have, to be, they have to be coaxed into doing this. They're brought to the breast of their mother, and their mouth is put on the breast of the mother, so as to to eat. And if that resulted in a painful thing, then they would have an aversion to it and wouldn't do it. It's only because it's causing a sensation of pleasure, presumably because the hunger is being sated, that they do it the next time, and they do it habitually. And that you always, and, 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 and that as you go on to eat solid food, drink, whatever, you, that has to um, relate to a sensation that you had in the past. So it's not as if, a, if babies are born with an innate mental module that says, okay, I've got to eat, or I've got to drink, and that they're already able to act on that. They actually have to learn that behavior like everything else. So on, it's on very, this view. very binary. It's like everything is, everything is learned, basically. This is you. Well, I don't know what binary means it's in two. You like, mean, sorry, like it's, it's one or the other, like, there's no, it's just everything, is, everything is learned, there's no such thing as a mixture. Of every, every, everything in the mind originates in sense. Okay, everything. There's no other basis for anything in the mind other than sensations. Okay? Um, and there's no other basis for any kind of action or movement. Okay, moving the limbs is basically what, how we distinguish between being alive and being dead. And there's no basis for moving the limbs except aversion, I'm trying to avoid something, or um, desire, I'm trying to get something. I move either towards or away for some, from something. Okay, so I think, I think instead of binary, the, the term you're looking for is reductive. He takes, uh, he takes something very, that seems very small, like sensation, pleasure, pain, appetite, and he reduces all activities to those causes, and says that they actually are nothing but those causes, and they don't have any other causes. And, and in theory, everything can be explained by those simple causes. And remember, his goal is to explain everything <laughs> on the basis of what nobody could disagree with, of what everybody has experiences of. Because the goal is ultimately to eliminate controversy where it exists in the political sphere and try to bring our politics to, into a greater resemblance to mathematics where we don't have these controversies. So in mathematics what we have is agreement about the principles and the starting points. We all agree about what a point is, and what a line is, and what a triangle is. And therefore, we all agree that the interior angles of a triangle add up to the sum of two right angles. But we don't all necessarily agree on what's good and evil. Okay, but, and so we have, we have conflicts about this. And not just conflicts, we have wars about this. Okay, so if we want to eliminate those wars and those conflicts, we're going to have to find a concept of good and evil that we can agree on, and that's going to require tying it to something that we all experience. And that means reducing it essentially to sense, because that is the only thing that we all definitely have in common. 
or can say that we have in common. It's the only starting point we can, we can be sure of in his view. So it's really a reductive account. Okay? It's binary in the sense that he recognizes um, pursuit and avoidance, or desire and aversion, or pleasure and pain. Those are binary concepts. So there, there isn't something that's both pleasant and painful at the same time, or something that you both desire and have an aversion to. Spice. Or you Spice. Uh, well, okay, so, I mean, we can, we can go through these counterexamples. In his view, if you like <coughs> spice, then you're actually getting an enjoyment out of it. Yes, it's an intense thing, but you're getting an enjoyment out of it. If you don't like spice, so that's me, for example. I really like spice. I ask for extra uh, hot um, salsa and things like that. My girlfriend, who cannot ever have spice in anything. It's a nightmare when we're ordering together in Indian restaurants and so forth, because I'm saying add extra spice, and she's saying take all of the spice uh, out of it, because it causes pain for her, and she has an aversion to it, and doesn't want it. Same objects, but for her it's evil, for me it's good. Okay? So, um, but it's not the case that for me it's both pleasant and painful. Okay, now, he does recognize that you can have a series of things that are painful and that you undertake on, on the assumption that it's going to result in a, in a greater pleasure or a less, lesser pain later. So, it's very painful, I know, for you to be in here right now, listening to this lecture instead of outside where it's nice and sunny and with your friends and doing drugs or drinking or whatever, okay, it'd be a lot more pleasant, so why are you here doing this apparently painful thing? Because it's in a train with things that are leading up to something you think is going to be very pleasant, like the glory of getting an A in this class, or the glory of getting a degree from UCSD, or the glory of getting a good job because you had this degree, and so overall, we say that that entire series of events is pleasant, is pleasurable. But that's just because it has a preponderance of pleasant things in it, even if it, even if it includes painful things along the way. But the, the, case, the case you're giving is interesting because could it be simultaneous? You know, could something be simultaneously pleasant and painful? And that's where masochism becomes um, a problem. Because supposedly, there's people who enjoy pain, right? Who, um, who get pleasure from pain. Now, there's another analysis of what's going on there, and it has to do with the pleasure is not the actual sensation they're getting, but they, they have fantasies of domination or something like that, and so they undertake, a, they undertake these smaller pains because it gives them this greater pleasure of being dominated, or being in this power relationship, or causing pleasure to this other person, or uh, whatever. But if there really is a phenomenon of people experiencing pleasure and pain from the same object at the same time, then Hobbes' theory has a problem. But it's not at all clear that there is any such, such phenomenon. Okay, that, that can't be given his analysis of it. Okay, that, 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 yes, we're taking on some pleasures because we have a conception that that causes greater pleasure. And that must be based on some analogy to something we experienced before, like experiencing graduating from high school. And that required actually showing up to class and doing the work. And you remember the great glories of graduating from high school, and you essentially want to repeat that, and so you're willing to take on these uh, pains in the meantime, just as you took on pains doing it then. And then, why did you do it in high school? Because it was an analogy to what you were doing in, in junior high, or in, in grade school. And before that, there were little things that were, that were analogies to those set up, like parents rewarding you for reading a book or something like that. Okay, and, and it's, you, 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 you uh, get inculcated with these pleasures and pains, and then you think back to those whole 
uh, chains of them. But if there, if there isn't anything that you can draw an analogy to, then you wouldn't be acting in that way. Not only wouldn't we be able to explain your action, it's, it's not clear that your action would be possible. So there aren't zombies, things that can't experience pleasure or pain that nevertheless walk around and do things. There's no such thing in Hobbes' view. And I think he's got a pretty good point. It's hard to explain how something that can't experience pleasure or pain could move or have any kind of action. Okay, and plants don't move themselves around in space, and that's because they don't pursue or avoid anything. Why? Because they can't move themselves around in space and they can't sense anything. But animals, they pursue and avoid things, and our own account of our behavior is essentially that of an animal. After all, again, I hate to break this news to you, but we're all animals. And so just like your cat comes, pursues its food and avoids predators, all it's doing is trying to get those pleasant sensations and avoid those painful ones. Okay. Now, please don't interpret my harsh, grating, and irritating didactic tone here as saying, I'm acting like this is all obvious and this is all clear and this is how it has to be. I'm taking on the persona of Hobbes here. There's a lot of problems almost at every stage of what I'm saying here. But this is, this is his theory. This is, this is what he would say. And, and if you can present me some psychological evidence about masochism that says, no, it's clear that they've got pain and pleasure at the same time. I'm not, I, you know, you'd have to come up with definitions of pleasure and pain and, those, and I'd have to agree to those, and then we'd have to agree that there's actually somebody that pursues that activity that results in both of those, but then you would have some kind of empirical evidence against this view. And that's exactly the kind of evidence Hobbes is interested in hearing about this theory and that would count against it. Yeah? Why does it matter that like, you can't have a pleasure pain? Like, I'm just, like, bigger picture, why does it matter? Because um, you can't, the, the, the explanation of behavior and action, why actions are undertaken, wouldn't, um, wouldn't, wouldn't work if they could be simultaneous. Um, or if, I guess, I guess the problem is if somebody would pursue, if there's some sense in which somebody pursues something painful or avoids something pleasant. His bedrock assumption about explaining behavior of animals and humans is that we, is that all of this movement of our limbs pursuing things has to do with pleasure, and all of this movement of our limbs avoiding things has to do with pain. So if they could exist simultaneously, either we, would we move towards that object or not? Hobbes would, Hobbes would have to say that we both move towards that object and don't move towards that object. That we have both a desire and an aversion uh, for it. Okay, and so then, then, then there would be big problems for the theory. Yeah? Stockholm Syndrome. That's where, that's where people... People fall in love with the person who like, took them hostage or is their captor? Yes, so that's, that's, the, that's the explanation of it. They fall in love with that person. So they think that that's a pleasant thing, and they want to avoid. They want to pursue the things that that person tells them to pursue because they think it will bring them the pleasures of, of requited love of them. But in cases of Stockholm syndrome, it often goes hand in hand with some sort of aversion. Like they still have some sort of aversion to that person. It, it's not. It's not as simple. As right, it. and so and so then then it's a case where there's where there's mixed pains and pleasures, which I've, I've, I've said how he tries to explain those, that the agent must, um, must think, must have some experience and relate it to some idea of undergoing pain in order to get a greater pleasure later, okay? Like Stockholm Syndrome is explained exactly the same way as your being here in this class right now is explained, okay? Yes, it's mixed in with pain, but there are much greater pleasures to be had if you stay with it and complete this course. It's very course. consequentialist, and like, in the sense that that's really the only thing that matters. 
like the I mean it's not the the means, it's really just like the end. Well, yes, except that consequentialism does look at the ends and the effects of things, whereas this is coming from the direction of the motivation of why the activities are taken. And it, it assumes that um, that I'm, I'm thinking about the consequences when I'm deciding whether to act, whether those painful things are worth undertaking to get this greater amount of pleasure. So in that sense, yes, it is consequentialist, but there's altogether less emphasis put on on these these ends and purposes and remote aims and more focus put on, and I think Hobbes thinks this is more important to what our, our really basic motivations of, of doing things are. Yeah. Um, so by Hobbes' theory, it's either that you have versions or or like you have um, you either like want something or don't want it based on sense and like your um, past senses, what is taught, and there's no such thing as like a biological instinct before you experience something or conceived of like experience. Well, the the there is the biological. It's already tied in with the theory of biological instinct. Okay, because the things that are pleasant, what are those? Those are just conceptions whose continuation affects, uh, helps, or augments vital capabilities like nutrition, reproduction, self-motion, um, survival, things like that. So. The very things that we experience as pleasant are things tied to the good functioning of our bodies and of our, of our biological reality. And the things that we call evil, that is the things that are pains, are the things that we have an instinctual reaction against because they damage those vital capabilities. So it is tied into a notion. It, 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 we can relate it to an idea of, of instinct and, and biological. Uh, in, in fact, in the case of animals where we don't have very advanced conceptions, we just have these sensations and pursuit and avoidance behaviors and maybe a little bit of memory. It all depends on that. Okay, They have an instinct for eating this kind of food and avoiding that other kind of food. <coughs> turns out the ones that they pursue are the ones that actually are nutritious for them, and the ones that aren't are the ones that actually inhibit those vital... But how would Hobbes explain like, an animal that had just been born knowing which foods to eat? Because if all conceptions are based on sense, they've never they haven't like, tried all the foods and seen which ones are bad for them. So he, they either have to learn it, as in the human case, or an, if there are analogies to that elsewhere in the animal kingdom, or they do it by trial and error and experience. And so they actually do start out just eating something and it might be harmful for them. And, and there might be a kind of um, survival of the fittest that the ones that survive are the ones that find pleasant those things that are truly um, conducive to their, to their vital capabilities. Um, but yes, it can't, he, what, what he can't imagine is that there's some animal born with no senses and nothing in their cognition and that it somehow automatically starts pursuing the right, do, eating the right kind of food or something. Okay, that, that has to be something learned in his view or um, it, it has to be learned and that could either be by trial and error or instruction from parents or whatever. Um, and so if you can find evidence out there, empirical evidence, that there are animals without any kind of sensation that, that do that, that, that invariably the first thing that they eat is, is like beneficial to them. Turtles that are born, they know to go to the ocean. But like, there's no adult turtle there telling them you have to go to the ocean or you're going to die. Like, yes, yeah, so so there must there must be some there must be some pleasant thing that they that they're experiencing 
they find it pleasant, the light of the moon or whatever, which is in the direction of the, uh, of the ocean that they're going towards, or, they, or the water feels more pleasant to them than the air, and, they, and from an experience they have of it. Um, so he has to tell stories like that, but if you could, but maybe that's maybe that could be a counterexample. Maybe you could say no. There's some kind of there's there must be some innate mental structure that tells turtles to walk towards the um, sea once they're born. Um, that would that would be that would contradict this theory, and it would be empirical evidence against this theory. Okay. Um, so. Uh, Notice that he reduces honor and dishonor just to these to these pleasant these good and bad things which are just pleasant and painful things. So further further reducing these high-minded terms we have like honor and glory just to down just getting down to, to sensations of pleasure and pain. And then he has a theory of passions of the mind. Again, passions, the term passion just means affection or emotion. Or, to put it simply, things that we just have, that happen to us and that we feel. Um, we've already talked about passions of the body. The passions of the mind that he talks about are things like glory, humility, shame, curiosity, admiration, etc. And all of these get defined in terms of awareness of one's power. And the power, again, relates to the power for experiencing pleasant things and avoiding painful things, which is tied into the vital capabilities. And, um, and you could scrutinize each of those definitions and see, you know, for example, love gets reduced to lust. Okay, now, depending on the kind of person you are, that's either a totally ridiculous theory or that's actually a completely accurate and clear-eyed view of the matter. Okay, but in his view, that's, there's no difference there. Love means you think that person's causing you pleasure, and so you desire to be with them, and so on. Um, and that it has a power for um, bringing you pleasure. Yeah. So with pleasure and pain, nobody really teaches you um, the senses and what they feel like and what they mean. So with that be kind of an example of more of an instinctual thing, because you kind of determine, or more of a subjective thing, because you determine for yourself what is pleasurable and what is painful to you. And these, and these differ, right? Some people, in my view the correct people, prefer chocolate to vanilla. But there's these crazy people out there that, that think vanilla is really great. That must be due to their experience, and the difference must be due to the difference of our constitutions, such that, uh, and, and um, those are the only differences that could explain that. Now, we aren't taught what's pleasant and painful, we experience that, okay? And so we pursue those things that we experience as pleasant. So if somebody tries to instruct you and tell you that something you feel is really painful is actually really pleasant, that cuts no ice whatsoever, because it doesn't occur to your senses, and your senses are the only things that are going to convince you that anything is true. Okay, so, um, now often we do things taking, taking on somebody else as an authority. Oh no, this is really great. This new flavor of ice cream you've never tried. I tried it before and it's really great. So you might trust them and then try this weird blue colored ice cream to see if it really is good. But then if you're either going to experience it as pleasant or painful and there's no amount of teaching that, that changes that for you. I mean, there is an issue of acquired tastes uh, and things like that. Those, those would complicate the picture. But you're right, nobody teaches pleasure and pain. These are things that we sense and we experience. And so the things that we, in fact, pursue are those things that are pleasant to us or that we're convinced are pleasant. And we stop pursuing them if our senses give us uh, some kind of different experience of it. Right? So, if you experience continual failure in, in um, grade school and junior high and high school and so forth, 
you're probably not going to be able, it's, it's going to be very difficult to convince you that you should go on and try to have the glories of college. And don't worry, it's a lot more fun and that sort of thing. It's just not in your experience, and it's really difficult to, con to convince you about that. Yeah? Are sensations uh, restricted to the five senses? Well, the six senses, because remember he said that there's also this internal sense of remembrance. Um, but yes, sensation comes down to the, to the five senses plus recollection of them. Okay. Yeah. So like your own thoughts can also give you pleasure. Yes, yes, sure. And because what are thoughts? Thoughts are conceptions. What are conceptions? Decayed senses. Okay, so like thinking about a human being is some kind of decayed impression of actually seeing and sensing human beings. Does he account for religion at all? Because people think they go to heaven. Yeah. That's not something to yeah. Do. So I maybe this is a good time to move on because he I mean he did the reading for today, right? No. Okay. So you're asking a dumb question because the people who did the reading know that yes, he talks about religion. In fact, he offers a proof for God in the bit that we read for today. Um, okay. So let's talk about that. Starting in chapter 10 of the differences between people and their discerning faculty and the cause. You might think since we're all the same, we're all human and we all experience the same objects, these things that are out there in the world, why are people so different? Well, in one sense, they aren't very different. They seem different because we're on the ground, but they're all act actually pretty much the same. And if you were looking at us from a telescope from Mars, you'd say those are just masses of people like ants or something, and there is no difference between them. In fact, that's how we think when we look at ants. Um, if you actually were an ant and on the ground, it would seem like there were big, huge differences between all of these things that were, that were going on. Um, so what he's really interested in is why are some people um, stupid and dull, and why are other people more quick-witted and smart and things like that? Um, and he says that the difference has to do, and this, this seems to me very implausible, so this is a case where I might myself find evidence against what Hobbes is claiming. Difference of wits has its origin from different passions and the ends to which the appetite leads them. So the intellectual vice of dullness supposedly comes from or proceeds from somebody whose appetites are focused on mere sensual or bodily delight. So somebody who the, they're, they're focused for some reason, they're obsessed with the pleasure that you get from drinking and alcohol. Um, that is a pleasant thing, but it's going to inhibit their ability to um, wake up in time for class and study and do all those other things that are pleasant in some, in some other sense and produce effects that we consider to be intelligent or something like that. But it's as if this is all voluntary. So here, he doesn't think there's just a genetic difference between people. Some people are just born stupid and some people are born very intelligent. There's no notion of innate talent or ability or anything like that. It all depends on what ends you, uh, you pursue and people end up pursuing different ends. Why do they end up pursuing different ends? Um, because different things seem pleasant to them. Why do different things seem pleasant to them? Because they have different constitutions and different things that they actually uh, sense. And so then he explains all of these other um, virtues and vices of the mind as relating to the different kinds of passions and the objects that are pursued by the people to which we assign those virtues and vices. Now, chapter 11 is where he deals with religion. And the way he deals with it is by saying what imaginations and passions people have at the names of things supernatural. So you can see, even in that title, a very skeptical approach to all of this. 
And Hobbes is very often in the literature called an atheist, and he was accused of being an atheist. An atheist is somebody who denies that God exists. But that doesn't sit well with what he does in the second section of this chapter, where he actually offers a proof for the existence of God. Okay? So he begins by saying, God Almighty is this incomprehensible thing. We don't have any conception. Of course, we don't have any sense of God. Uh, now, there's an issue of religious experience and epiphanies and things like that. We'll have to see if he can handle that kind of experience. But um, has anybody in here had religious epiphanies or had a direct vision or illumination of God or something like that? I mean, in which case these arguments might not be as convincing to you. But if you haven't, then you're in the condition of most people that, he says, most of us, we don't have any sense of God. Um, and all of the attributes that we give to him, like ineffability and immortality and so forth, are essentially negative characteristics that express our inability to know anything about God's uh, nature. But he says, we can prove that God exists because there has to be a first cause for everything. Okay, if we chase, if, if, if we trace the chain of causes back and back and back, it can't go on infinitely because then it never, as it were, could have got started. There has to be something that initiated the whole chain of causation that results in there being these external objects that are moving somehow and thus producing effects on my senses. And so what I really mean by God is whatever the initial cause of the, the existence of those motions external to me. Okay, And so remember, Hobbes is not a solipsist. He doesn't believe that Monty Johnson is the only object that exists in the universe. Okay, He thinks there really are objects external to us. And those objects have to have a cause for their existence. And we don't know what their cause is, because everything we know has to do with the effects that they have on us. And so whatever their cause is, our name for that cause is God. How does that solve the problem? It was like, what caused God? What came before? It's yeah, God caused God. Okay, so God is the name of the primary cause of the of our existence of, of the objects that exist and produce effects on our senses. So it, it doesn't solve the problem, it just gives a name to it. But he's not he's not really trying to solve that problem. The problem he's addressed here is what are people talking about when they're talking about God? Right? Lots of people talk about God. What the hell are they talking about? What sensation can this be tied to? It can be tied to a sensation that one thing causes another. This is a fundamental thing that we sense, that some things cause other things to happen. Fire causes things to warm up. Ice causes things to cool down. But what caused the objects that cause any sensations whatsoever? Again, we can't have access to those. We can't take a shortcut from our mind directly to those objects. All we have is what comes into us through our senses. And so whatever caused those things is God. We have a sense of that because we have a sense of causality. Okay, but so this solves the problem of how people generated a conception of what God is and why that why you hear that term being thrown around all the time. Okay? And that's the problem he's trying to address here. But if you have some other problem like how did God create that world, or how did God create those objects? There he says we just have, we have nothing to say. Everything is, all, all of our terms for that are essentially negative. Now I was actually calling on somebody Sorry, behind yeah, you. No, no, that's okay. So, so is this basically the same argument as Thomas Aquinas, like first mover teleological argument? Well, you should have said it's actually like Aristotle's argument, because that's where Thomas right. Aquinas got it. Okay, and if you were taking my course on Aristotle right now, you would have learned that already. Um, but, uh, so, 
the it, it, it is it is that widespread proof right. proof of the first cause or whatever and Aristotle makes that argument in metaphysics book 12 and Aquinas comments on that book and then developed his own set of proofs for the existence of God this is the main one this is the one that that most people who believe in God agree is the most important of these arguments and so he accepts that and he puts that here. And the result is that he's not an atheist. So if you don't like atheists, you don't necessarily have a problem with Hobbes. Because he doesn't just say that God exists, he got a, he's got a proof for God's existence here. Okay? But he, um, but he doesn't comment on God's nature. And he doesn't think anybody else can comment on it. Because where, where are they getting those conceptions? They're getting them through... Uh, through sense, and nobody has any direct sense uh, of God. So that, that still might put him at odds with like, an organized church that has conceptions of God and rules. Well, and, and, and yes, and it very much does. Right. But also, remember his motive in writing this whole thing, to eliminate political chaos and civil war. What is the cause of this political chaos and civil war? It's essentially religious disagreements, disagreements between Catholics and Protestants and so forth. So disagreements about religion are a big cause of civil strife, and so he'd like to eliminate those by getting us to agree on this more minimal conception of God and then agreeing that, that, that the differences we have about him are not things we can actually resolve scientifically because they can't be tied to senses. And so they certainly should not be incorporated into a conception of government that we're, that we're building. Um, and he has other strange views I don't have time to spend on, but if incorporeal spirits is, is, is an idea that doesn't make any sense to him, um, so he says, if there are spirits out there, if there are ghosts, or if there's the Holy Ghost, or if God is some kind of spirit, then it must actually be a physical body. And so he's got these weird views about how maybe these things are actually just very rarefied uh, bodies. Okay, uh, the next chapter is how we deliberate from passions and these produce our actions. And this is really important because this is Hobbes' theory of action. Okay, how it is that we act. And to make a long story short, and I've given an example here, there's some external object, for example, a chocolate cake, and this causes conceptions in me, like, mmm, that would be a tasty thing to eat. And that conception causes appetite or fear. For example, it causes an appetite of wanting to eat the cake because I want to have that sweet sensation. Or as in my case, it causes a fear that this is going to undermine my diet, and thus undermine my health. And these are the so-called unperceived beginnings of our actions. Now, how do we, what do we actually act on? He says, either we act on the first appetite we have, like when we act all of a sudden, there's a cake there, and I just say, oh, great, eat that cake. Um, or, if the appetite itself is succeeded by the fear, like, oh God, this would undermine my diet, which would undermine my health, then we withhold from the action. Now, but it's possible that we can have a continual sort of succession of this um, appetite and fear. Right? So, and this is what often happens when somebody offers us a piece of cake or a cigarette, or, or a joint, or something, right? You, 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 you think, ah, oh, that would be pleasant, but actually that would be painful because it would undermine my diet or make me not able to study or whatever. Ah, uh, but yet, you know, there's always other time I can study, and so it would be worth enjoying that now, etc. And all there is is just an alternation of these. Um, and the last one is what we call our will. So, 
yes, it's going to ruin my diet and so forth, but it's just so tasty and, you know, this person's gone to the trouble to bake this cake, so I'll eat it. And so I do. So my will is that last piece of deliberation. Or, given my incredible and legendary strength of will, the refraining from eating the cake and sticking nobly to my diet is my will because I refrain from that pleasure because of uh, fear, okay? And so voluntary actions, he, say, he says, are those that have their beginning in will. Now, I've just reduced will to the last stage of deliberation about any kind of object, and appetites, fears, hopes, all the other passions um, are not called voluntary because they don't proceed uh, from but to the will. They lead up to the will. So, so when I'm just considering, I don't know if I'm going to eat that or not because it might be pleasant or it might be painful, that's not, that's not um, will and that's not voluntary. That's just a succession of imaginings and conceptions going on.